Uh, welcome to this panel discussion. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing myself a bit. I'm Nina, I'm 23. I'm from Vienna. I'm an artist and I just started my own management company together with a good friend of mine two years ago. It's called Braless Management. And yeah, I'm going to be hosting or trying to host <laughs> this panel discussion today. Um, we're just going to talk about the rapid change in the music uh, like industry and also what it might look like in the next 10 years with a special focus on green touring and um, digital versus analog merchandise and live streams also versus live in-person concerts and how that all shifted in the last few years. Um, yeah, as an independent artist myself who's never planned a tour before, but planning to do that in the near future. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to learn some stuff. Um, we have four industry professionals here, um, and I'm just gonna ask you to introduce yourselves. Maybe we'll start from here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Simeon. I'm from Utrecht in the Netherlands. And I run a booking agency called Treetop Agency that I started in 2015, representing over 50 artists from 19 different countries across genres right now. I also manage two bands and have little projects all around. So I guess tour planning is my kind of thing. <laughs> I might have to hit you up at some point. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Proki, I'm from Prague, Czech Republic, I'm a producer, multi-instrumentalist, and I have my solo project called Bad Focus, which is like a uh, alternative electronica uh, solo thing, and yeah, happy to discuss the things with you guys. <laughs> and you will play later this evening, right? Yeah, I'll play at 23.30, so make sure to be here, it's gonna be, be cool. So my name is Quirina, I'm also from the Netherlands. Um, I'm working there as a venue promoter and um, I have been working for uh, mostly underground venues until now. Um, and my background is in anthropology. Wow. Your turn. Oh, okay, hello. Uh, my name is Kuba uh, and I'm a sound engineer uh, coming from Poland. Uh, and I'm really not used to being on this side of stage. Uh, and I'm actually, while sitting with you here, guys, uh, doing the mix on my phone and not playing the snake uh, <laughs> or anything like that. And I'm glad to be here. Cool. All right. So I guess we're going to just start with a little bit of looking back at the last years or the past years you guys have been doing this stuff. And what has changed in the music industry since then? So in terms of like streaming getting more popular, how merch evolved, um, people are also maybe getting more familiar with green touring and like being more conscious about it. And then also obviously what changed during the pandemic. So live streams and in-person concerts and all that. Um, so let's maybe just start about, uh, with, uh, what even is a green tour? What, like, how do you start even planning a green tour and how does that look like? Maybe start with you. I don't know. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, I feel like it's consciousness, like environmental consciousness in general, has been rapidly growing over the past years. It's like, it's not like I've been in this industry for 40 years and the changes are massive. Like people yep. have always been thinking about it and it's usually creatives, I think, that stimulate that sort of change. The only thing is accessibility. Like does our economy allow for all those brilliant ideas to be, to be actually executed and what I've noticed over the past few years is that more and more rights organizations, uh, funding platforms are focusing more on helping artists support, like supporting artists in those endeavors. Like for example, Pluggy here is wearing a Eurosonic t-shirt. Uh, Eurosonic 
just launched uh, since this year uh, a new funding system for all their showcasing artists, covering up to a thousand euros in the cost difference between green tours and their regular tours. So if you plan your tour and you think like, wait, I don't want to hire a fan, I'd rather hire backline at all the venues so I can travel by train, they will cover the difference from your usual touring costs to, to make that possible. And in so many countries, there are examples like that that are, that are great starts um, because it also makes all those artists and their teams think about how can we actually do this. Um, yeah? You got something to say about that? Does anyone else have a point to that? Well, uh, yeah, I've uh, personally never planned a green tour uh, with my manager or with my booking agent, but the thing uh, that I'm trying to do for uh, concerts that have like a smaller budget for, for a fee uh, is that I'm uh, trying to get my setup to, to like a smaller setup, like a reduced setup, so that I can take it with me by train, which is uh, great because uh, then s the setting it up uh, during the sound check is much quicker and a lot less effort. And it's great because I can travel by train, which I, uh, which is how I travel here. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's definitely uh, one of the struggles that artists have to face, uh, reducing their setups and trying to implement the backlines into their setups, which is not easy. And yeah, we've actually uh, never had the chance to to uh, really like implement the, the green touring I into our uh, sort of, uh, how to say it, our approach to, to, to tours because uh, the budgets are really tough. So we are glad <laughs> when we are at zero uh, in the end. So it's really nice that these initiatives are, uh, are starting to pop up. Yeah, definitely. I feel you on that. <laughs> um, do you have a point to add or? Well, for me, I mostly work for the venue itself. Um, so, I, I know. So when I work for the small venues, I notice it in the little things like no plastic uh, bottles and only use glass, stuff like that. But I also work in a big venue called Sigurdome. It We can host events for seventeen thousand people, and the whole building is built around hosting concerts. Um, so our infrastructure is pretty set, um, and it's for us it's tough to. <laughs> so the wind is really tough here as well. <laughs> but for us, it's really tough, uh, for example, to inf impl implement uh, hard cups um, because we have to change the whole infrastructure of a building. It, it sounds like an easy thing, and it's also a thing that I personally have a lot of feedback on in the venue itself. So I try to push it. Hey, we have to be the first to implement hard cups or whatever other uh, change, uh, which which is better for the environment. Um, but there's always, always a lot of buts in, in the big infrastructures. So it's an interesting challenge. Um, uh, and it's hard to see that it has to start, or it's, it has to start bottom up, uh, instead of the big companies that. Yeah. So I think you just have to find the priorities or like the things that are actually doable and just start from there, probably. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add or are you still busy with the sound? <laughs> Second one? All right. <laughs> then I guess, um, yeah. I think, I mean, you talked a bit about that and I'm kind of interested in it because um, one question that I have here is how realistic I is it actually for an independent artist who does everything by him or herself um, to be part of this, like financially um, and also like setup wise, like how much do you have to limit yourself? Because um, for me as an artist, sometimes I'm just like, okay, I'm playing a concert in Sweden. Um, okay well, what do I, what can I do? Like, can I maybe like play concerts on the way there so I don't have to fly? Or can I maybe like just, I don't know, plan like a little tour in between so it actually makes sense also financially for me. So um, yeah, how, how realistic do you guys think it is for like an independent artist to actually 
go green and like go on a green tour and do all of that and like plan a green rider and all of that. So yeah, maybe you are the one who can better answer this question, but yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of ideas and it's not like these are all ideas I implement myself, but just what I see uh, people do. And, and I think like there's, always like the big challenge is financial and as a booking agent like saying oh can't we find some shows on the road yeah that's an ideal scenario but it's also can we find the right venue is there an audience there does it make exactly. sense to do it at this time um, when it comes to green riders I think what I've really noticed with a lot of bands is that they have updated their hospitality riders I think the logistics when it comes to sound having to drive fans like those are things that are really hard to tackle, but you can start with your hospitality rider. Be very clear about what you want. And also, like if you're on long tours, it's usually a lot more healthy to have vegetarian or vegan riders, for example, so you don't end up touring in Germany having schnitzel every day. Um, <laughs> people get more creative when there's challenges on the hospitality rider, so that's an easy start. Um, the same goes with not demanding 24 plastic bottles of water, but bringing your own water bottles. Yes. And even you could, I've seen artists, like if it's a long show, ask stage managers, like, can you refill my bottle during the show if you see it's empty? It's easy things and people That's can awesome. help out. I think another thing, which I think is really great, which we've once done ourselves, is it's not just the band's movements that that's not really good for the climate, it's also audience movements. Because if you play a big city, it's not like everyone lives in the street at the venue. People come from all across the country to see your show. And Coldplay is doing that, for example, on a massive scale, organizing buses to, for, so the fans can come together. It's one bus rather than 30 cars. And we've done that with an album release show ourselves. Like we had a band from a small town, but we had the album release show in Amsterdam. So we arranged buses for the fans to come to Amsterdam together rather than driving separately which is also a great audience experience. Like you all go together, no one's the sober driver, everyone can drink, it's really fun. Um, and you turn it into a whole day. And I think the bigger the show, the larger the artist demand, the easier those sort of things become to arrange. And I think it's not fully the artist's responsibility. Those are things maybe venues could even help with, like depending on ticket sales, chasing the t ticket sales, like, hey, how many tickets did we sell in which areas of the country can we help arrange transport for those people? Mm -hmm. I think we but need to also, look at it from two sides. Yeah, and uh, but then the challenge for us as promoters is in the to to make sure it doesn't uh, translate in the ticket price or that the fees get lower. So we have to find sort of way in which um, a concert is uh, staying cheap as cheap as possible and the fees are honest. Um, yeah, but also go green. Because what I have the fear that it might translate back in ticket prices, which reduces then uh, the crowds. Yeah, what we did in yeah. one example when we did it is we, we had bus tickets available and we started with one and once we sold that one out, we arranged another one based on demand. But usually it ends up to be cheaper to jump on a bus rather than just the parking fees in big cities alone, you know, a and having your own gas money. Like we charged 10 euros for a bus ticket and everyone was like, that's great because that's like one hour of parking in Amsterdam. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but that's just one example, of course. But I think finding ways to stimulate it from an artist side to, for the audience to go greener as well is where we can make really big wins. Like I know of one record label in the Netherlands for one album campaign. Uh, they did the thing like for every LP, we planned a tree. Not that that makes the LPs any more environmentally friendly. It's just about showing the artist ha is like very like environmentally aware and stimulating similar behavior in the audiences. I think and I have. A, I think yeah. I have an interesting example. We had Billie Eilish in Ziggo Dome a few weeks ago, and she uh, she actually um, made sure that we as Ziggo Dome um, made everything vegan. So 
we have uh, uh, yeah the, the the caterer who has uh, a picture of a hamburger for example on a wall we had to make sure the hamburger was not to be seen because everything had to be vegan which is really good she really um, that's awesome yeah she really puts us on the block <laughs> Which then also, we, we do have uh, discussions with the caterer. Hey, how can we um, get more vegan possibilities? And for them, it can be like, oh, vegan, we don't know that much about that. It is hard. But now they can be shown by being pushed uh, that it isn't that hard, actually. Um, and then again, she also, uh, in her show, she, she really puts a stop in her show to... Yeah, to talk about the environment, she has really young, a really young crowd who really looks look up to her. Um, so I think uh, she, as an artist, really yeah, focuses on that well, and is a good example of how, as an artist, you can also have impact in just the way you talk, what you speak about to your fans. Um, yeah, yeah. You guys just answered all my prepared questions. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so. A bit more about merchandise. Um, speaking of sustainability, um, you could claim that merchandise is not sustainable. I mean, it, it's not in most cases. Clothes. Um, <laughs> and but it's very important for artists' income, obviously, because especially with today's like poor streaming revenue for most of us. Um, so yeah, how do you think? Because um, Another topic here is about digital versus analog merchandise. How do you think digital merchandise could even look like? Because I can't even imagine anything. Like, no. well, is it just like stuff you have on your phone or laptop or something? Or I don't know. I don't really see uh, digital merchandise in the form of an app. But I, I do did have seen some sort of interactive merchandise. So. At a show of BTS, we also had in Zigodome, we uh, or they sold sort of light bulbs, which then interacted with the light show, um, and it has a BTS thingy on it. So it was really expensive, but everyone bought it. Um, I think it's not sustainable, though. I think it's probably not. Yep. Um, but if you talk about digital merchandise, I, that this is the first thing that comes on my mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything. Uh, well, I think uh, there's a, a great chance of uh, doing a digital merchandise with uh, the new technology that Web3 offers, which is NFTs, basically, which are non-fungible tokens. Oh, cool. Uh, that actually means that you can release your single and you can sell it as one unique piece to a person with uh, something tied to it. It can actually be, uh, I don't know, a part of your royalties. So when someone, someone buys your NFT, it means when the album is suddenly very successful, he gets money of it. So it's uh, suddenly becoming like an economical uh, thing more than a mer merchandise. So that's that's one thing. And, and uh, can I ask you something about that? How can you show to people that you have a sort of token of that artist? Because the meaning of merchandise mostly is in yeah showing off in a way, being part of a group. How does that work in that system? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and that's the downside of it. Uh, it's not that well showable, uh, and I think the only way to show it is uh, when you have uh, some sort of a gallery of NFT, you can show it there. Uh, there are galleries in the metaverse when you can show it in the virtual reality, which is wow. a completely different world uh, that starts uh, to open to artists. Uh, yeah, it's starting to becoming a thing really lately. And I'm trying to sort of uh, look into it, uh, but it's it's uh, really new to me, so I don't understand it that much. Maybe there's also can you buy merchandise in gaming? I mean, Travis Scott did this uh, concert, right, in this game environment. I yeah, don't. That's don't basically exactly yeah? it. Yeah. 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 Ah. Yeah, and there's more examples. Like I think physical merchandise will never be gone because like just like when people go on a vacation they buy a souvenir they do the same at a show they yeah. like to remember they were somewhere by having things it's like visual hold reminders something in their hands, hold like. something and it's also a direct way to support artists like you, we can make it greener in the little things like when we order our cds and lps have them not put plastic wrappers around it yeah. just the little things but we'll always have physical merchandise and we'll always 
profit from phys physical merchandise. But one thing that's been really, it already existed, but it's been booming throughout the pandemic when people weren't able to go physically support the artists they like, um, is an American website called Patreon, which is basically a subscription-based uh, fan website. So it's like a continuous crowdfunding. Um, and what you can do there is like release your single a week early to your subscribed super fans, do videos that are not released anywhere else, or do the demo versions of your albums that won't be on Spotify because they ruin your algorithms, but people still like to hear the difference between how you started a song and the end product. Like, and I think subscription-based exclusive releases and things like that um, are a way to connect the super fans. And also there, like, there's continuous technology in building like chat groups in those services. So the super fans can connect together. So the be being part of a group side of things gets covered more. Um, and it's not like a Facebook private group with one super fan deciding who's in or out. It's subscription based and anyone's welcome. Um, I, and I think there's like, that's a great thing for our, yeah, for fans to be able to connect also when an artist is not on tour. True. Yeah, maybe for physical merchandising, I see a lot of local artists working together with local clothes makers, designers, um, to, yeah, uh, using circular fabrics, um, but also, yeah, support your locals by, yeah, collaborating instead of going to the bigger merchandise company and buy it in big bulks. Um, and also you can do it combined. You had the band Boney Macaroni, right? Who did sort of tie-dye for a little bit of a higher price, but then also the normal merchandise. Yeah, and yeah. like, and we decided to do organic and fair trade t-shirts anyway. Um, they're getting, because there's a larger market for it, they're becoming more affordable. And you've got good quality, so people are willing to pay a little bit more for a t-shirt. Um, I've seen artists who have a silk screen and just like go through thrift shops every now and then and just silk screen their logos onto used clothing. Um, but I've also, and I forgot the name, apologies, use Google, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, there's websites popping up, merchandise companies that you can integrate with your online web shop and they produce according to, to the amount of orders. So they only they produce when it's ordered and ship it directly for you. Oh, that's um, amazing. Which means it, it doesn't get transported to the artist for the artist to ship it to the fans. It goes in one direction and there's no spare merch. So you don't have like, oh, it's the end of the album campaign. We need to get rid of these t-shirts now. You, so you throw them out. No, it, just the amount, the amounts that are sold are produced. And I think if it's, I mean, it's expensive, but if those sort of things develop further, I think that's a great way to do it. True. Um, do you have anything yeah, to add? Yeah, it's kind of funny that you guys uh, brought up this topic uh, because uh, that's exactly what we do with the band uh, that we tour with. Uh, I'm with, I mean. Uh, we work with local uh, manufacturers uh, doing our own gadgets, like, uh, I don't know, uh, lighters, uh, T-shirts. Uh, and uh, we do that to support like local communities. And in terms of like going digital, uh, we also plan uh, to like distribute our music uh, online, uh, but giving the people uh, like uh, possibility to pay mm, whatever whatever they want, the amount. Like uh, we used to do that when it comes to physical merchandise, and uh, we're always getting uh, more cash out of it because people always want to support us uh, instead of like giving like a uh, fixed price <laughs> for it. That's amazing. Um, all right. <laughs> um, if no one has to add something to it, I'll just continue with the next point. Um, yeah, I think we can all agree that the last two years have shaped the music <laughs> industry a lot. Um, especially also when it comes to concerts. Um, so live streams have gotten very popular and the idea of like watching a concert just from your couch in your living room. And I think some people, at least in Austria it's that way, it seems to me, um, have gotten like 
more comfortable with just, okay, I'm just going to sit at home, um, watch a concert instead of going out. And it's kind of still that way. Um, not like on a large scale, but some people just like to just chill at home and not actually go out anymore. And so, yeah, first of all, what do you think about that? And do you think that actually live shows will get back to where they were before or what the situation will be like now that we're kind of like, I don't know, starting up again? Mm, yeah, it's a tough question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, we or Just what you guys um, have seen from experience, because we're all new to this situation, obviously. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So regarding ticket sales, especially the local shows, so so the bigger shows like like the, the big venue shows like Billy Eilish and stuff, they they still do fine. They 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 sell out, and it, it, it looks like it hasn't changed. But when we talk about the local shows supporting local artists, um, then then we do still see a decrease in ticket sales, um, and it worries us a lot because as a venue, you you have the yeah, the duty to support local artists and to bring local artists to the crowd. Um, and yeah, if the crowd doesn't come anymore, we have to find solutions. Um, that can be a combination of live streaming, of course, and um, and uh, do it live for an audience. Um, but we are also dependent on ticket sales. So um, in my experience, live streams with a ticket sale. I used to I organized a live stream festival in during Corona, and then the big question was: Okay, do we do a ticket sale? Or do we do pay what you want, or uh, do we do it for free? Free wasn't possible because of the budget. Um, but yeah, we did a sort of a pay what you want system, um, which worked out. But um, I did a sort of uh, research and in interviewed a lot of people uh, from the crowd and I don't think people would really love to pay for a live stream um, and then you have to look for uh, okay what's the meaning of a concert why do people go to a concert and as an anthropologist you always say it's because of being in a group finding your identity connect with the artist um, and that's that common experience um, we have looked into apps if we can recreate such an experience in, uh, yeah, in apps, um, there are possibilities, but still you're on your phone. Sounds yeah. tough, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've, I think um, I, there's two sides to this in my experience. Like what you say about like real life experiences, I'm not a I became a booking agent for a reason. Like I believe in the magic in that, and I don't think a live stream sitting on your couch can replace that. However, I've that. seen examples of tours. Um, for example, recently one of my artists was opening for for a Dutch pop rock band called Direct, who are very popular, and they decided they had their hometown show as the last show, and it sold out like that. And tickets are pretty expensive, so it's not very accessible. So for the last show of the tour, next to having the live experiences, they also did a really high quality live stream and did pay what you want tickets. And it's like for a tour that's already sold out or for people with disabilities who can easily access the venues, it's a great way to have it additional to the live venue show. And they had over 200,000 people watching who bought tickets for a live stream who also wanted to be at the 2000 capacity show that sold out so quickly or who didn't have the money to buy a ticket, but had, had the money to watch it at home. And I think having it as an additional layer on a popular live show works really well. And the other side of it, if you want to look at just digital experiences, we need to forget everything we know about concerts. Like We need to start completely over mm -hmm. and may, turn it into a new experience that we can bring to the people live, like artists, playing concerts in games. Uh, so your virtual identity is is at the concert together with your virtual friends. Yeah. Um, and there's so many things. Um, there was one artist called Spinfish who released like a new acoustic EP during COVID and he cre turned like he created an app with an AI concert. Like he also he usually uses a lot of props on stage 
So you could point it, he was like, okay, point at a table, that's the centerpiece. And he created it like that all these like theatrical objects he usually uses on stage were like moving through your living room and like things that like worked with the lyrics were flying around and it seemed like your cutlery drawer would go open and like your scissors were going through the room like cutting holes in the wall and and it added a different level to the songs it was completely different than a normal show but it did fit his profile as an artist and i think when we're talking digital experiences, as long as technology allows it, we can do anything. Yeah. Just forget what a real, what a live show is like. It's really interesting because then you can collaborate with so much different disciplines for your shows. The whole thought of it would be different, but I hear you talking about digital a lot, so. Uh, well, <laughs> I actually had one experience uh, a few months ago when I had a concert, which was both physical in a club and both in the metaverse. And the funny thing was there, there was actually like 30 times more people in the metaverse than in the physical. <laughs> so, so the concept was that I was like with some sensors. Uh, I, uh, I was like streamed into the metaverse when there was this avatar playing these instruments and the sound was streamed there. And uh, it was like a metaverse festival. So then I connected with the headset to the metaverse concert as well uh, when the other artists were playing. And uh, it was a great experience, actually. It was quite immersive. The visuals were great because in the metaverse, it's almost uh, it's almost real. It's a virtual reality, but there are there's not a gravity. You can come through walls. You can do anything there. You can build anything there. You can do any visuals you want, and everything is just dependent on the programmer who's programming it. So, so, so that that was a great experience. So that that's what I think uh, could be. Uh, the future of streaming and, and it could be a competition with physical concert because it, the the the, uh, the experience is really immersive you can meet uh, someone who is from the other side of the world and talk to him at the concert you can dance with him even which was quite funny the digital you know <laughs> yeah, so. do you have typical dances for your character no oh. <laughs> <laughs> would be great if you could study in your your dances and do your sort of other thing <laughs> True. Uh, do you have anything about to say about that? Because I, I imagine you have, since you're a live engineer. And yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, like um, the pandemic stuff was like a short period for us, uh, and I think we're pretty much uh, back to the normal uh, as it used to be. Uh, but we definitely noticed that uh, live streaming uh, got a lot, uh, lo a lot more popular than it used to be. And uh, nowadays, uh, when we tour, we, we play like uh, folkish uh, stuff with acoustical instruments. So it's always uh, like nice having the audience here to, to dance and sing with us. Uh, but uh, when we tour, mm, like people come to us after the gig uh, when we return to the hometown, and like, hey, it was a fantastic concert. And I'm like, were you even there? And uh, they're like, no, 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 I was watching you on the big screen, guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's nice because uh, we're making fun that we always bring our, our audience. <laughs> uh, since uh, lots of our like common uh, friends um, just simply love us as a band, uh, people. Uh, but not always uh, like they're able to, to, to come to listen to, to the music and have fun with us. So uh, there's always like uh, at least um, 20 uh, people uh, listening to the music <laughs> uh, online. So yeah, it's cool. Can I ask you a question maybe? Like you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, me. Yeah. So for you, yesterday you gave a show and it was really intimate. Thank How you. would it be for you if you played in a game? I've never done it before, um, so to be real here, my experience with live streaming concerts has been horrible. <laughs> like, um, I think I played two in my life, um, and it was just like, okay, I'm just like being at home, like kind of trying to do this. Once I was at, at a venue, that was a bit better, but it's just a bit weird when you're, for me especially, because I'm, my songs are very intimate, very emotional, very me and not get the feedback is always a bit weird because you're just like you're singing your heart out and then 
no one's clapping, but you're like, okay, but 50 people are watching. Ha! Huh? I don't, I don't get it. Um, so yeah, that that was kind of my experience with it. So I, I don't know what it would be like for me if I like played a concert in a game or something. It would be definitely a fun experience. Nothing I would not try. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think this this like all of your points are very interesting because um, for me, like I said, it just wasn't the best experience till now. But I think there are so much more things that are worth exploring regarding that. So yeah, I think your experience is the experience of ninety nine percent of yeah. artists <laughs> who started experimenting with it. But I think the experiments itself like are f worth worth the effort. Because knowing what you didn't like about the experience open, opens up doors about, for making it better in the future. Mm, um, true. But yeah, not having artist feedback is something I think every band has struggled with. Like one of the punk bands, like emo punk bands I manage called Boney Macaroni, did, did a show, like was the, it was their first show in, in a while because the front man had been away in the US for eight months. So, and the first show back was a live stream in an empty venue. And they played oh the God. worst <laughs> show they could have ever played. Like, they were just not on point because they need to bring so much energy to the stage that they require the audience to, to give them some of that. Yeah, um, but, yeah. And, and I think it's a, it's a huge challenge and, and maybe savvy technological guys can, can help us solve that. But it's also interesting because the past few years, a lot of young or starting bands have been playing online. Uh, we did a, a pop competition with, with bands, uh, which is really to support their talents and uh, to, to, to sort of get them the, the first start of their careers. Um, but they had to do all their shows online. Um, and one of the main uh, pointers of these competitions is to get experiencing with experience with live uh, performances. Um, so sometimes I still notice or feel like uh, some uh, bands don't really have the experience yet with live crowds that, that they would have, uh, yeah, wanted, uh, maybe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know how that is for you, but something. Um, I mean, I've had like a lot of. I've done this for ten years now, kind of. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with l playing live shows. So it was more like the other way around that playing like a live streaming show was very weird for me, because I I'm used to feeling um, getting like the immediate feedback and like feeling kind of what people what people are feeling and kind of like playing for people and not just for like an empty room. So for me, it was just incredibly weird. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was actually the same. I was just um, gonna ask, yeah. And uh, the thing is, like, because I'm a, uh, like mostly a producer working in studios, I'm quite used to playing for no one <laughs> for a computer, or I would say. Uh, but the thing uh, that I uh, sort of noticed that is ne needed to be prepared for the live stream is some sort of a, uh, how to say, it, some s uh, sort of a dramaturgy of the show like when you uh, say what how it's uh, good to have a script of it then you, f you feel much more natural that was uh, what was helping me but i think that, that the future is uh, in the hybrid concerts as simeon said when you have uh, even a few people that you play for and that is being streamed some somewhere else uh, online i think that's uh, even if it's like five people it gets you some sort of uh, sense that you're playing for someone, actually. Yeah, exactly. That you're not alone in the room, which was it always happening. It can also happy. be a great way for artists to just, you know, also get more revenue out of their concerts and get more people there that maybe can't be there physically, but they want to watch and want to be there because they want to support them. And yeah, I think that's actually a very cool way of doing it. Yeah, I think in the end, like everything we've been talking to, it's like in the essence of music, whether it's like euphoria or sadness or whatever, like we're it's about communication through emotions. Exactly. And the best thing we the easiest thing we can do as as people is read the emotions of other people when we're together in the same space. And once you go digital, how do you trigger similar emotions? Yeah, and it's also had to, has yeah. to fit your crowd. You can be yeah. creative with that. Like, mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think that's the fun. It's that's the fun challenge. It's like how can I communicate what I want to communicate through my music in a different way and make the audience feel something, even though it's completely different than yeah. what we're used to. Maybe we are forgetting a little bit about TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm as, also not on TikTok, but, so artist mistake number one here. Yeah, but I'm, I'm guilty. As Whatever. <laughs> yeah, but as an industry, I think we are just starting to discover TikTok, but there has been happening a lot of stuff on there, which I don't know shit about, but... Maybe there's something in there also that is sort of starting already with the online small content, building a platform, and from there on, maybe you can really build uh, live concerts online. Oh, yeah, and I think, the, the, I mean, I, I'm not on TikTok. I prefer <laughs> listening to a full album. This so is the problem the of the industry. Me, <laughs> but I, I think we can all <laughs> agree on that. <laughs> yeah. No, but like some, the, the one thing I really like about it is it stimulates audience participation. Or it, it, you get surprising views, like Dutch artists who won Eurovision uh, called Duncan Lawrence suddenly like got a big boost because people started like singing his songs with Harry Potter, Harry Potter scenes. Like, no one would have thought of that. And millions of people were like, yeah, this works. This is awesome. And it's like the, the music got an entire new function. Or even like with Boney Macaroni, again, like we have a song called The Claw. And apparently there's like the really cheap American beer brand called White Claw. And there's like this big scream like, you saw The Claw, you shook it. And we had like these people, like Americans on their porches with their White Claw half, half liters shaking it and like letting it squirt in their faces on that like on that little thing and it's like okay so the audience hears something different in the music than we ever thought of and it's super fun um so even when it and it comes to all social media like if you like it or not like try and do it in a way that's fun to you and the, your audience might surprise you like true um it's a it, there's an opportunity there and i think like having audiences do with the music what they think is suitable or is fun is, is pretty exciting. Yeah. And I think we have to remember that there's not like one way of doing something. There's like, I think every artist for him or herself has to see what works for him or her personally. And yeah, I think it's just about finding what fits and what's right for you and what works, I guess. Yeah, I totally agree. Awesome. Um, anyone has to has something to say or any questions for each other that you maybe have? All right. All I'd say is like we're here the rest of the weekend. So if anyone out there who heard this in their tents or here on the benches feels like this is a topic they want to keep discussing, feel Come free. To us because I think the only way to to find solutions to all our challenges is by Dialogue. just talking about it and inspiring yeah. each other. Exactly. And so I heard some fun stuff here, so thanks everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, come to us with your nerdy questions. Um, if anyone has something to uh, add or ask, feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, I think we're done for now. And yeah, we're just gonna keep the discussion <laughs> going off the stage so thank you thanks for being here cool thanks a lot thank thanks. you